we continue with the 25th chapter of the book of Yirmiyahu. Hadavar Shayer Hayal Yirmiyahu. Al Kol Am Yehuda Bashana Revit Liho Yakim Ben Yoshio Melech Yuda Yashana Rishonat Livnevucha Netzar Melech Bavel. So these are words that came to Yirmiyahu um, concerning all of the people of Yehuda. And it's in the fourth year of the reign of King Yoshiahu. That's when this is taking place. The fourth year of the reign of King, excuse me, not Yoshiahu, of King Yehoiakim, the son of Yoshiahu. Okay, so if we're taking this, and it's the first year of Nebuchadnezzar Malach Bavel, I believe it's uh, about the year 605, 606, something of that, uh, of that matter. So yesterday, if you remember, we talked about that the chapter was probably around the year 593, that just is something we pointed out in the past. That's part of the reason why it says Hadavara Sharayal Yirmiyo. Usually in, in the Tanakh, it's we have the Vav Hahipuch. It should see it should say Vahaya Dvar Hashem El Yirmiyahu. That's the usual way. We start with the Vav. And uh, when you're when you're having um narrative structures, when it's when it starts with the noun and later has the verb, it means something is out of order. So this was years before that. We know the book of Yermio generally is not a book that is in order. It's not in chronological order. How it was composed, how it was put together, what chapters, I, I'm clueless and I, I don't know. Somebody probably knows, but that person's probably in the heavens. So what is the message that comes now? Nebuchadnezzar, we talked about the North yesterday or two chapters ago, we finally mentioned that it was Bibavel who would destroy B'nai Israel. But this is the year now that Nebuchadnezzar is now reigning. Asher diber Yirmiyo Hanavi al Kol Am Yehuda vi al Kol Yerushalayim Lemor. When Yirmiyo who said to all of the people of Yehuda and Yerushalayim, Min Shlos Esrei Shana Liyoshiyahu Ben Amon Melech Yehuda vi Ad Hayom Hazeh Shloshim vi Esrim Shana Hayad Dvar Adonai Elai Va Daber Lechem Ashkem vi Daber Lo Shimata. Yirmiyo who says from the thirteenth year of the reign of King Yoshiyahu. And for uh, uh, from that time, which is 23 years ago, the word of God has come to me. I've spoken to you. I've warned you. I've told you things that need to be done. And you did not listen. So here we have, right? There's still going to be another 20 plus years or so uh, in your Miyahu's career, 15, 20 years or so. But he's right in the middle of his, his career as a Navi over and over again. He's warned them. They haven't listened to him, and now something is different. The prediction, the idea that Nebuchadnezzar, that the Babylonians are going to destroy Israel, is now much more believable because Nebuchadnezzar is on his way. Not only Yirmiyahu was sent, God sent lots of prophets, but you didn't listen. Lay more. What do those prophets say? When God said, turn back every one of you from your evil ways, your wicked acts. But you didn't. You didn't listen. And by the way, we're at least uh, about the fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth word in this verse. We'll have words that are very similar to this that are read. We'll read Monday afternoon. When the people of Ninveh do do tshuva, when they repent, and it says also, That's part of the question people ask, well, why do, why do we read the story of Ninveh? Why do we read the story about B'nai Israel uh, asking for forgiveness and doing tshuva on Yom Kippur? Well, the answer is, is that we don't really have as great stories of B'nai Israel doing tshuva. We have it from the people of Ninveh. We don't see it here, certainly in this book. There are times during the life of Shmuel and others, but not in the way that the people of Ninveh do, and certainly not in this book where it's over and over again, you didn't listen. Continue verse 6. And you continue to vex me, says God. You continue to not listen. But you didn't listen to me. You you angered me with your hands. Right? You, you That's what you did to me by, by making idols and then... Uh, Taking advantage of the poor, etc., etc. Lachain, Koamara denies vote. Yana Sherlo Shmatamet Dvara. So this is what God, and again here he's God, the the uh, the Elohe Hat Svaot Svaot the Tzava, the army, the Lord of Hosts, the threatening name. This is what's going to happen because you didn't listen. 
Hinani Sholeah, Blakati Komish Bachot Safo, Numa Adonai Bel, Nuvuchanetzar Mount Babel Abdi, Laviotima Arts, Azot Al Yoshev, Yakoa Goyimelis Abdibach, Rintem, the Samtim, the Shamba, the Last Reka, Ulecharvot Ola. I'm going to send the people from the north, led by King Nebuchadnezzar. How is he described here? Abdi, my servant. Nebuchadnezzar is doing the work of God. Think back to Bereshit, right? Avram sends Avdo, he sends his servant to go find a wife for his son. The servant has to listen to everything that Avram says. That's the idea. Nebuchadnezzar is listening to what God is saying. He's He is God's hand which we've had here in this book earlier, allusions to it, but never before where it said fully Avdi. We had allusions to it with Sancheireb back in the book of Yeshaya, where the way that Yeshaya describes the Assyrian. And so it's just uh, certainly noteworthy when we think about Nebuchadnezzar, I think about Hitler's willing executioners and so many other things to think about uh, just uh, theologically and philosophically. And what's going to happen? He's going to destroy you completely. It's going to be ruins for all time. We're in verse 10. This is something we've talked about in the past that we have. It's again one of those verses, the undoing of Yeshaya. I'm going to banish what's going to be lost forever. The sounds of joy and gladness, the groom and the bride, even the sound of the mill and the light of the lamp. It's going to be completely destroyed. Everything, destruction fully, no happiness. And this land will remain desolate, and the nations will serve the king of Babylon for 70 years. By the king of Babylon, it doesn't mean king Nebuchadnezzar, but it means the kings of Babylon. 70 years is the first time where we see this phrase, uh, this term, that it will be a 70-year exile. Whether 70 is supposed to be uh, understood literally or not is, is questionable. The same way we have 40 very often in the Tanakh, 40 represents a generation. 70 more represents a lifetime. There's going to be a lifetime, and it's about 70 years for about 586 to, I think, 517, 518, 516. I can't remember the exact year in which, under the reign of Darius, the Jews finally rebuild the Second Temple. But it is a 70-year period. But 70 means a generation. That's what it means. The world will be, Nebuchadnezzar and his army will be in charge for 70 years. Bahaya, Kimlo, Chivim, Shana. And after these 70 years are over, you should know it's only 70 years. It's only a lifetime. The Chaldeans, the Babylonians, they will not reign forever. They, in turn, will become desolate. The message that we had so many times, especially in the book of Yeshaya, civilizations rise and civilizations fall. The Babylonians come in, they have their role, they'll be God's servants, but they will fall as a result of the destruction that they have committed to others. We're in verse 13. I'll bring upon this land everything that I decreed in this book, which Yirmiyahu prophesied against or for all the nations. Because they will also be enslaved by other nations and great kings. And I will right, punish them the consequences, the karma will come right back to them because of their conduct. So yes, in a sense, you could say that Nebuchadnezzar, that the Babylonians were God's hand, were God's messengers, were his avadim, but it has to be willing executioners. They will be punished for what they did wrong. And this is something we have in different places in the Tanakh. We talk about Yeshai, of course, to the Assyrians. We talk about it in, uh, I think, in Habakkuk and in other places where it talks about the nations. Yes, they will destroy B'nai Israel, but they too will re will. Uh, be punished. Now we continue with the second half of the chapter. Kicho Amar Adonai Lo Yisrael, Eli Kachet Kos Hayayin Hachema Hazot Miadi Vihishkita Otoat Kol Hagoyim Asher Anu Kisho Leach Otcha Aleha. God says, "Take from me this cup of wine, this cup of my wrath." In other places, it's called a Kos Hatar Ela, but it's a, a cup that represents God's wrath. It's going to be, in a sense, poured out. And all the nations whom I send to you too will drink of it. In the first chapter of the book of Yermio, we talked about Yermio being a Navi Lagoyim, not just to Bnei Israel. We talked in the last, this week about his prophecies to the people still in Yerushalayim in Israel, his prophecies to the community in Bavel that would return to Israel. And here we see now beyond that scope to the nations uh, surrounding Israel and Bavel and in the region. Vishatu, Vihit Goashu, 
Beinotam. They will drink and they will wretch. They will throw up. They will go crazy because of the sword that I'm going to send amongst them. So it's not only B'nai Israel who's going to suffer as a result of Nebuchadnezzar and the great Babylonian army. It's going to be all the local peoples, all of the countries. So I took the cup from God's hand and gave it to drink to all the nations to whom God had sent me. Whether this is supposed to be understood literally, that Yermio really did it, whether he does it in a, in a dream, whether he does it symbolically, it doesn't matter. Yermiyahu is, in a sense, um, what God is predicting. Yermiyahu is, is you know, is now foreshadowing in, in the actual pouring of the uh, of the wine to the nations. We're in eighteen. At Yerushalayim, that are Yehuda, that Melachem, that Sarah, that Teitot, that Mecharbal, that Shamal, that Shreikal, that Kolak, that Yomazer. So, who does he start with? <laughs> the people of Yehuda, the people of Yerushalayim. Its kings and officials will be, right, it will become a desolate ruin, the city. It's going to become a curse, an embarrassment. But let's continue. Yesterday, Mordechai, you asked about, at Paro, Melech Mitzrayim, at Avadav, at Sarav, at Kol Amo. The alliances uh, to try to uh, withstand the Babylonian assault, the Egyptians, they will also drink this bitter cup. And all the people in the land of Uz, so here we have in the Gaza region, right? Ashkelon, and Gaza, and Ekron, and what is left of Ashtod. So everybody's going to fall. Those are mostly on the other side of the Jordan River. So we started with Israel, we went down south to, to, uh, to Egypt. We sort of came a little bit back north to the Gaza region. Now we're crossing... Uh, the uh, the Jordan River to the other side for the people of Edom, Ammon, and Moab. We had Kol Malchei Tzor. We're going north into Tzor to Tyre. Ve'Kol Malchei Sidon. Ve'Kol Malchei Ha'i. Asher Be'Ever Hayam. All the kings of Sidon, the kings of the coastlands across the sea, whether it means islands. We've had E used in different ways today. E, E, Yim are, are islands in in uh, in modern Hebrew. So could be coastlands, could be islands. Ve'at Dedan, Ve'at Tema, Ve'at Buz, Ve'at Kol Ketutzei Pe'a. Right, Dada and Tema Buz, they'll have their hair clipped. They call Malche Arav, they call Malche Ha'erev, Hashokhnim Babibar, all the kings of Arabia and the kings of all of the, right, that have, uh, it's like America, it has uh, all sorts of different nationalities, Malche Ha'erev, all the kings of mixed peoples who live in the desert. They call Malche Zimri, they call Malche Elam, they call Malche Madai. Zimri, the kings of Elam, the kings of Media. Interesting, it says the kings of Media, Parasu Madai, is going to be the Persians, the Medes are going to be the ones who actually defeat the Babylonians. Maybe the Babylonians defeated them first. I don't remember historically, I can't tell you. But uh, in 539, with Balchazar, that's going to be the Parasu Madai. Here it says Malchei Madai. Okay, who come and destroy them. Verse 26. So all of the kings, the ones north, right, all over, everywhere, wherever you think, this destruction is going to happen. It's going to be everywhere. And lastly, it says the king Sheshach. Who is the king Sheshach? So there's an idea in, in uh, with Hebrew, something that's called Atbash, which is that there's sort of a coded language where the Hebrew words are reversed. So an Aleph represents a tough, and a bet represents a shin, and a gimel represents a chaf. It's like a sort of, sort of coded backwards language. So sheshach in atbash, I think it's pointed out by the radak, is means bavel, because the second letter of the aleph bet is a bet, second to last one is a shin, the and the chaf is is interchangeable in terms of the letters of the alphabet, the aleph bet with a lamin. So what it's saying is yes, the Babylonians are going to destroy everything, but just like it was said, verses above. The Babylonians, in the end, they will also drink. Revenge will come at them, and it will poison them as well. So we see here complete destruction of everybody, and then the Babylonians as well, as predicted twice. Verse 27. So say to them, right, drink from this cup, and you will fall, you will become drunk, you will vomit, and you will never rise again. That's how destructive it will be, and presumably it's talking to everybody, all of the different nations. And when they refuse, you tell them that God said, you must drink. This is what's going to happen. And the sense what that means, right? Don't resist. Remember we talked yesterday? Coming back to this, the, the people who left in 597, who went with the Bukhanetzer the first time, Yehonia 
and those others, they're the ones who Yirmiyahu who tells them in the future, you will return, buy houses there, and then you'll come back. The people who refuse to drink, the people who refuse to accept the punishment, they will be destroyed. Because I'm bringing a terrible punishment to the name that bears my city, and nobody will become will be unpunished. Everybody is going to uh, fall to the sword. You offer this prophecy to them and tell them God roars from on high and bellows from his high place. He roars over the earth, uttering shouts like like uh, Lucy, treading the grapes against all the dwellers on earth. That's It's going to be God is roaring. God's anger is, uh, is uh, coming through. Interestingly, uh, this verse uh, we describes... Uh, God's crying out um, in the middle of the night. When we talked about early Masechet Brachot of, about going up and waking up in the middle of the night to offer to David. <speaking in Hebrew> Destruction has reached the earth because God has a case against the nations and thus God will deal with all of the flesh through the sword. <speaking in Hebrew> Disaster is coming from one nation to the next. A storm is unleashed all over the earth. And that day the earth will be strewn. It's going to be bodies everywhere. Think of apocalyptic patients, uh, paintings, not patients. There's going to be nobody more than God. Oh, there are going to be our, our carcasses everywhere. Cry out, shepherds, yell, right? Dust, to throw dust all over the place. For the days of your slaughter draws near. You will be destroyed into pieces like the falling precious vessel. Here it's called a klichemda. If you remember a couple of chapters back, we talked about the bak book. We talked about the jar that your meal throws into many pieces. And so we see that again, it can never be put back. It's the glass everywhere. Flight will fail from the shepherds and escape the, the flock. Cry out, scream how, because God is ravaging your the place where you shepherd. And the peaceful meadows will we be wiped out by God's fierce wrath, right? Today, it's peaceful. You're out there with your sheep. They're walking around. Nobody knows anything. The weather is nice. Not going to continue that way. Azav kakfir suko, ki haita artsam neshama, mipnei charon hayona, umipnei charon apo. Like a lion, God has gone forth from his land, and the land is becoming, will become desolate because of his wrath, because of his anger. So we have here, uh, you know, a chapter of just destruction. Destruction is going to happen. The king is in exile, and therefore, because the king, in a sense, is in exile, destruction is going to happen. That's where Rashi sort of understands this line, leaving his, uh, leaving, leaving his, um, his lair, and it's just going to be a time of tumult, of horror, of destruction, and it's going to be for everybody. And we know that's the case. We know that violence begets violence. It's not going to stop just because it starts at the beginning. And so, yes, it starts perhaps with Egypt in terms of the causality or in terms of the significance of our book. It starts with Israel. It starts with Jerusalem. But everybody else is going to be swept up in the violence. And destruction is going to happen. And a new world order is going to start with Babel. And it's going to transform. It's going to be a different world order with the Persians, and then it's going to transform again with the Greeks. And so we have here really just a, a very difficult chapter, not one of the only ones, uh, but um, an interesting chapter in the sense that, um, you know, finally, Nebuchadnezzar is named, and right, the sort of difficult theological and uh, understanding philosophically, what does it mean that he is a servant, and what does that say about God, which is what the book says about God's violence and anger 
uh, in this book. And just think for one second, compare it to, last thing we'll say, the book of Yonah, where Yonah, we're reading on Monday, that's we're talking about it, Yonah's going to say, God, you should kill the people of Nineveh. This is not truth. They were sinners. Why are you going to let them last forever? This is not Emmet. This is not truth. And God says, oh, you have all these people. Why should we kill them? Let's be merciful. God believes in tshuva. God believes in repentance. God in that book believes in second chances. In our book, it's just destruction. And the simple answer is that the Jews, this isn't the second chance. This is the, you know, 3,740 second chance or something like that. We don't know the exact number. And maybe that's the difference between those two. Hard to tell. But that's, you know, one of the things about the Tanakh, obviously, so many books over so many ages, there's not one way, there's not a sort of consistent theme in understanding the way God acts, the way humans act, et cetera, et cetera, for further thought uh, in the future.